This week on Review Ed, welcome, and I uh, wanted to give you a chance to listen to a few few stories this week. Uh, we're talking about Book Renter and their new efforts, uh, doing some really pretty innovative things uh, beyond the rental of books. Uh, Apple, I want to talk a little bit about their rejection of Seth Godin's latest book, just to continue our saga of uh, Apple and their uh, e-book mess or success, however you want to look at it. Uh, children's books, you know, do are, are they moving away from nature, and is that a problem? Uh, there's some recent research that suggests that maybe they are and maybe it is. We'll talk about that. Uh, I'll take some time and talk about Dell and their new platform. Uh, it's just emerging, uh, only getting some sketchy details out of it, but already on preview, it looks pretty amazing, and I think portends a lot of where the LMS market is headed. And then finally, talking a little bit about a lawsuit in Washington State uh, that relates to the uh, funding of online education and where we fall on that. So, welcome this week on Review Ed. This is Review Ed episode 18, recorded March 3rd, 2012. This is going to be a short episode. This episode of Review Ed is brought to you by LanguageLab.com, bringing the world of English to you. We all know the best way to learn a language is to be in a place where everyone speaks it. LanguageLab.com offers total immersion in English City, a 3D virtual platform where students from over 90 countries learn English online with highly qualified native speaker teachers. English City is open day and night, seven days a week. Discover uniquely designed courses for general English, business English, oil and gas, and aviation English. Go to corporate.languagelab.com. Welcome, everyone, to review at episode 18 uh, with my co-host Christopher Dawson and myself. Chris, did you know it's the 10th episode we are doing together? I wow, checked already. Yesterday. Already, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's already been two and a half months then, though. So. Time, time flies. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, uh, I'm happy as every week um, that you find the time with your various other occupations over, <clears throat> of course, at ZDNet, also at VizIQ. I think uh, you gave up uh, sleeping almost totally um, to finish the uh, book for Cengage Learning. And um, what else? I added more chapters, though. I added <laughs> more chapters. Cool. I don't know what I'm thinking. We, we, I, I got through some big chunks, and I said, no, I haven't told the story yet. So so now I, I have more chapters to write. But, but progress, definitely lots of progress. And you also have the uh, honor to uh, keynote the big, uh, what is it, a Blackboard conference? Their, or is it, it just a developers conference? conference. With, uh -huh. yeah. okay. But it's, it's right before their big conference, so it's kind of a... You know, it's, it's not quite as cool as keynoting the whole thing, but they have really cool people keynote those. But, uh, but yeah, I'll be ke uh, keynoting their uh, DevCon mm -hmm. uh, in July, mm -hmm. and uh, so that'll be that'll be interesting. And uh, they actually have some some you know Blackboard uh, again, one of these uh, you know 800 pound gorillas in, in the room, but doing some interesting things. I think we'll see. Um, you know, I think they're going to, their position in the market is, is shifting, and, and uh, I hope for the better. Doing some K-12 initiatives, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, that'll be, I think, uh, so I'll figure out exactly what I'm going to talk about, but I think uh, part of it will be sort of the changing role of the LMS in education, because it is, it is shifting, and we're seeing some really cool things. I think we'll talk today a little bit about uh, some, some new LMS initiatives, mm -hmm. but it's, the LMS is, is evolving in ways that uh, even a couple of years ago we may not have expected. So I'll be, be uh, yeah, glad to talk I about think that. they are uh, acknowledging this a little bit. Um, firstly, uh, inviting you to, to make the keynote. Um, maybe um, not a keynote necessarily 100% pro and only Blackboard. I think that's, uh, that's interesting. And... Um, well, you can now count yourself in the in the inner circle. So uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I think great. that's a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm very happy for you. So, and due to due to our various well other things, uh, as you know, we we love to do. Um, Review Ed and myself also EduQuest, but um, 
well, we we ha we don't have uh, a day job uh, in a college or at a university. So basically, writing, interviewing, uh, speaking, this is our jobs, and okay. therefore we. I think have uh, compared to to the previous weeks at least um, have a little less stories. But ho however, yes. I think uh, we have some interesting stories for you um, this week as well. And um, well, we apologize in advance if we uh, <laughs> cannot give you a ninety-minute uh, episode. But maybe. I don't know, give us feedback, so maybe you like the shorter episodes as well. Uh, we don't know. Chris and I um, do... We're a little verbose. Yeah, we, I think <laughs> we love both. We do our best, and we hope uh, it's, it's usually thought through and uh, insightful for you, but uh, if you prefer shorter episodes, let us know. Yes, Otherwise, please. we cannot know <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if there's some good stories next week. If we can only do 45 minutes, it might be it tough be for, hard us. for us. For us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's that, and also uh, giving our our guests, uh, of course, the time to to unfold their ideas and uh, their perspective and analysis. So my stories this week will be sort of um, the continuation of. Uh, last week and the week before, not so much textbooks um, and uh, e-textbooks in the legal perspective, although of course we hope you found that interesting, but uh, sort of more stuff going on in the um, textbook space. And our first story is from uh, Book Renter. Well, the name explains the business model. However, um, just like we analyzed Czech uh, a little bit um, in the past, they also seem to see um, what is possible for them to spread a little bit uh, beyond that model of uh, only renting books. And um, they have a little, not a spin-off, but uh, a new project or a new addition to their offer called Refter. And um, a platform allowing teachers to uh, a see uh, the offer of relevant uh, textbooks out there and uh, compare them in price, uh, also see what these uh, books offer, and then eventually, of course, uh, select the best um, offer for their specific uh, class and um, of course along with they with what they want to teach and to me seems um, like let's say at a first glance um, seems to be a good addition to what book rent uh, have been doing until now and what do you think Chris is somewhat logic or no, I think I think it makes a lot of sense, and and I, I think there's a, there's a couple lessons out of this. You know, the, these companies that are doing book rentals and even book distribution, whether it's it's No or Chegg or, or whoever's you know working at, at new models of getting books in students' hands, yeah. it, it's quite clear that they're going to need to diversify and and differentiate themselves. Um, yeah, I think there, our story last week on No, uh, you know, with with. Cengage being such a big part of their business, and Cengage wanting to pull back and looking at their own distribution, their and all the other people and companies through whom they can distribute. Uh, you know, if these companies rely too much on the big names and don't have something else out there, they're going to struggle. And and I, I think that as the big publishers and then small publishers get their act together in terms of their own distribution networks, then uh, and their own ability to create e-textbooks, then. I think that we're going to see even further need for that. And the companies that don't have a wide variety of, of higher ed and, and, and K-12 focused offerings that relate to texts and materials are going to struggle. And um, I'll have a story later on that regarding Dell that, that points to this mm -hmm. as well. Uh, you know, I, I think this is a, a very good thing. I think the other, other lesson uh, is that, you know, it, it is really hard 
to know what texts are going to be the most appropriate for your students. And yeah. how many professors have, have we had or, or know of who say, you know what, don't worry about buying a book. It's the only books I can find you are 150 bucks. I'm not going to have you do that. You know, we'll have, class, have materials in class. We'll talk here. You know, textbooks are useful, and there's not a need for every professor to reinvent the wheel, even if they are subject matter experts, which they should be, of course. So, so the, knowing what you can give your students in a very sort of vetted way and, and allowing team-based and administrative decisions on this as well, I think it's a great idea. So I hope that this takes off. I hope people make use of it. Um, we'll have to see how the, how the market responds, though. As uh, teachers are generally so accustomed to using a uh, student's or school management system, I think the uh, idea to um, have a management system for courseware for books is not so far to, like for many, for many so that they could, if they really make it um, easy to, to get a good overview, to see the pros, the cons, the price, um, and um, probably book renter will, of course, have the function to make it uh, easily um, uh, purchasable, uh, so right. easy easy to buy um, or to, to rent to probably. Rent, right. Yeah, to rent probably more than to buy. Um, I think um, could actually be something of uh, value and. Um, also being a potential time saver to right. to many educators, so why not? So I, I kind of maybe uh, kind of like the idea and would think that there is some some business to be done. They have, of course, this enormous uh, 800 pound gorilla with check and check spreading and all those different verticals. Right. So it's a tough competition. But why not? I think uh, is about quality and then um, the ex execution by book renter. So uh, Refta could actually have uh, a future. Yeah, even if nothing else than, than helping to find a, a, a little bit different model for, for choosing and, and managing the, the text that, that we use. You know, we talk about the, the secondary book market kind of drying up in the face of, of electronic texts, uh, which really benefits publishers. Uh, so far, hasn't uh, been to any benefit for, uh, for students or, or, or instructors. So um, I think there's going to need to be some consideration of that as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's never, never a bad thing to try and introduce something to the market and, and see what sticks. Uh, but, but new tools are not rarely a bad thing. Mm. Uh, so now a uh, new uh, news from um, the Apple side, uh, Thess Godin, a, uh, in our tech space, um, not so much education, uh, sometimes he posts something uh, or some educational thoughts, uh, of course a uh, founder of uh, Squidoo, um, so Thess Godin uh, wrote a new book and um, put some Amazon links, uh, apparently too many Amazon links uh, in the book. Uh, he argues, uh, well, if I want to put them in there and I think uh, it's the, the best or most appropriate uh, link and I am the author, I have the right uh, to do or to write into my book um, what I want. Apple saying, okay, but then you don't publish on our platform. And um, it is a little bit, uh, or actually not only a little bit, but very much what uh, we talked um, a few weeks ago with AdBot. Uh, not only uh, how to publish and what to respect when you want to publish on the um, Apple platform and uh, using iBook author, but now... Hmm. I think um, it's a tricky pass, but I feel as links in an ebook uh, are part of the content. Um, now Apple starts influencing what authors publish in a way. I mean, yeah. it's it's not about the ideas uh, he publishes or, or the, the content 
itself in the book. However, um, in a normal ebook nowadays, you have affiliate links and uh, links to other products, right. and of course, for, for my information. And if you find all of those on Amazon, and so, what don't you find on Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> Everything's on Amazon, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so Apple saying, um, as as I got from the article, they contacted him and and told him that this is the crucial point why um, it got rejected. Uh, so either he has the opportunity or the, he has the choice uh, to change that, or uh, no publishing on Apple. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think his his it looks it looks like from the article his choice is is, is clear uh, yeah. because it's it's uh, you know it's appropriate to have the links in there and and it's mm -hmm. prerogative as an author. Now it's also prerogative the prerogative of Apple to pick and choose what it publishes. Unfortunately, you know, so much of what Apple does is all about ecosystem. So if you buy into the Apple ecosystem and and lots and lots of people have, I'm about halfway there, but mm -hmm. a lot of people have bought into it, like. Like millions and millions of people bought into it, so now they don't have the opportunity on their platform of choice to read what they want to read. And uh, again, this is a free market, and Apple can do as it pleases. Apple, I think, needs to tread lightly on this though, because it's not going to take too many folks like Seth Godin mm -hmm. to create a backlash against all this. So far, most of us techies have been fairly tolerant of it because it's a good they're good products. They yeah, make good yeah. hardware and software. Yeah. Great. But once we start really sort of infringing on the, the, the Technorati's uh, ability to, to mm -hmm. read and view what we want, it just starts sounding just horribly Aurelian, and, and which is something what people had always sort of predicted. And, and you know, we go mm -hmm. all the way back to uh, you know, that 1984 commercial, uh, yeah, you know, Apple, one of Apple's first big marketing pushes. But now they are like IBM. Back in the day, so, okay, so. and Seth Godin, of course, he's in a good position as um, he makes enough money um, with other channels, uh, but of course, is a an important figure in the tech world, and the story is out there. And uh, I think um, up to now, the people are not really on the barricades, but um, it adds piece by piece, bit by yeah. bit, and um, I mean, for for younger authors, uh, maybe with uh, less readership, um, it puts a certain pressure to, uh, like for the app developers, um, make it Apple conform, uh, what do they like, and so far with the apps, it's probably a little different, as they said, it's about the quality, but uh, but of course, um, Apple rejected certain content um, as not appropriate, and it's their right when they don't want to have something on the platform. But I think it puts a certain pressure on um, on younger authors, and um, maybe an interesting side story um, about Apple. Um, what was the product? I think it's a Final Cut, um, their yeah. editing program, uh, which cost the new version caused a lot of uh, problems and dissatisfaction amongst uh, creative people, uh, the, well, originally most loyal customer group um, of Apple. And it's interesting to see uh, that these people are now, or at least some of them, now changing back to Microsoft products. So they are, um, or at the very least, are using Adobe products. On, yeah. on, uh, I mean, Adobe took advantage of this big time and offered mm -hmm. big discounts for switchers from from Final Cut. A lot of people did switch to Premiere Pro and and to um, you know, the the full Creative Suite, which is a, a very expensive suite of software, but very very good. And if you no longer like something you've invested in, you know, why not make the leap? You know, you're right. There was a, a real groundswell around that, and and you know, Apple uh, certainly lost market share in in this area yeah. as a result of of their move to very much an app model. And and uh, there was a piece on ZDNet. I think it was David Morgenstern who wrote you know real concern about mm -hmm. uh, the the you know Mountain Lion and mm -hmm. and uh, you know the the, the need. To, to or Apple's inclination to move to this very sort of app-centric, iOSified sort of operating system, how much 
real power does that take away from from power users who, like us who use yeah. Apple products? Uh, you know, when when all of a sudden everything's an app, well. Does, does it make sense for that sort of a look and feel when what you really are doing is some hardcore production of, of content? Um, you know, I, I must say that, that my two primary content production machines right now are, are PCs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, of course, I, I, that's, that's uh, it's just easiest to get the, the right software that I wanted for it. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, different stories at the moment. On the one hand... Um, I, I I hear those stories, uh, people changing back to to Microsoft products, and we will see with uh, Windows 8 Same, and right. and all the the potential. On the other hand, we we also hear many Apple Pro stories. Of course, iPad 3, Retina display, new experience, and um, companies starting to uh, hand out uh, iPads to their employees and use these uh, as their main also work device, um, which is, uh, for me, I think we, we have to see um, what, what iPad is capable of. In my use, um, a little bit like you just said, uh, Christopher, um, work machines are... Windows uh, or at least PCs, um, although of course everybody, everything is PC, but um, let's say non-Apple products, whereas consumption devices uh, is different. It's very much Apple products. So I think we are at an interesting stage to, to, to see where uh, in the next month and, and years uh, it will really go. Um, I, I agree. I agree. And, and we're certainly, you know, we know that from the Mobile World Congress, there's lots of, of pretty cool products coming on the, on the Android and, and, and Google front and non-Apple front as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been testing a, a, the new Dell XPS 13, which they're kind of pushing in uh, this sort of educational ecosystem, very much a targeted at MacBook Air. Um, mm -hmm actually produced in, in a very similar way uh, with very similar form factor um, and and you know the the the, the, the desire to make comparisons is certainly right there, but when companies start, you know, the question is how much of it is just Apple cachet and, and how much are people willing to do to, to buy into that and, and, and have mm. a piece of that as, as app developers, as authors, but how much of it is really uh, just Apple makes cool stuff that we like, you know, if other people can make that same yeah. cool stuff. Can you see the shift? That's the big question because uh, I think Apple gets uh, still a lot of credit and rightfully so that they build machines that are simply beautiful but also give you a great user experience. Right. And I think the the new Ultra books, um, it's always if you um, chip in maybe a hundred or two hundred more bucks you can get a MacBook Air which is I think the comparison and um, it's really then the question will people at one point stop making this comparison and um, taking uh, products by different manufacturers in their own right and compare them maybe uh, in, in that line or uh, of or range of products or will they still continue always aspire always to comparing be <laughs> with uh, yeah is it um, the uh, copy or, or so and so version of a MacBook or MacBook Air or, or iPad so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they certainly set the bar very high, and, and you know, they hire some great designers to do great things. Uh, it, it, uh, I would love to see someone, you know, come up with something completely different, you know, that is, uh, I, I don't know how well someone can disrupt this market. I, I, I yeah. struggle to see that because what would you what would you put out there that's that's new and different, and interesting from a hardware perspective with a, a unified software ecosystem? I I don't even know. If I knew, I'd probably not be talking be. to you. I'd be uh, <laughs> making some <laughs> making a lot of money. But you know, I, I or I'd be a guest Maybe on your I show. Maybe I would be interviewing I, yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I don't know. I I think it. You know. Eventually, hopefully, some other company, maybe it'll be one of the big OEMs, uh, who will finally come out with, with that product that then Apple has to catch up with. But 
I don't know. That's the big, uh, it's, it's really the big question because at the moment they are all running um, after Apple in, in their innovation. And I tend to agree with uh, Kara Swisher of All Things D that until now, n not even uh, one of the competitors has, she says, has reached the user experience of iPad 1. Uh, I think undoubtedly iPad 2. iPad 1, I'm not sure. It's sort of leaning um, quite a bit out of the window, but uh, I, I, I mean, yes, it's no other tablet device has the the same experience and um, I mean I I count quite a bit on on Windows 8 what I have heard and uh, well they announced the consumer preview just um, over at um, in in Barcelona at uh, Mobile World Congress but I mean in the end Microsoft is not a hardware manufacturer and um, so they they are dependent that other manufacturers produce devices the customers want, whereas right. Apple uh, is, of course, is, is smaller, much, much smaller. I think I heard numbers that Microsoft is still over 90% and Apple 10% of the market. So, but of course, you have all out of one hand. And um, it saw through, and they drive still drive the innovation. And I mean, it has taken them probably yeah around ten years from the uh, right. first uh, I, uh, iPod. So if another company now says, um, okay, we want to innovate, uh, or maybe Android, or maybe Google with Motorola, I think uh, it needs. A couple more years. Uh, it takes time. We, yeah, it takes time, and it, probably a couple more years until we will see um, if that's really that's the innovation um, customers want, or if they are still happy and perfectly, or at least very satisfied with the yeah. Apple experience. Right. Yeah, I thought something was interesting with the Canonicals. Mm -hmm. Announcement of of you know Ubuntu running on on Android and and being able to take advantage of all these there's some pretty hard pretty insane hardware being announced at at MWC and uh, you know being able to take advantage of that so that your phone can be your device with the right docking station mm -hmm. um, and and I think that certainly we're making this move towards sort of the screen that that makes use of whatever sort of thing client technology you might have and you know that is perhaps one way that, that we can see some real innovation. Because as it stands right now, it's, it's sort of a, the one place where the user experience falls down on the iPad is, is where you're trying to do really serious work on it. Yeah. You can have your, uh, your Bluetooth keyboard or you can have you know, some other way or you just learn to yeah. type on a soft keyboard. But you know, it, it's, it isn't as good as a PC. And, and I don't really see Apple, perhaps Apple will, but perhaps Apple will say, well, here, you can have full-blown, you know, this is what we're, this is why we're unifying iOS and, mm -hmm. and, and OS X. Uh, but, you know, the idea that I could take my phone, which I always have with me, and plug it into a Sandrise dock anywhere, or a USB cool, cable, yeah. it is pretty cool. I have all my stuff all the time, and I have a full-blown experience. Maybe, maybe that's, you know, where things need to head. Um, we'll, we'll see where that goes. I mean, Canonical always has lots of great announcements and big dreams. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, aside from, you know, the, on the, on the server side, they haven't been able to make them happen so much. Yeah. Um, and I say that with, with utter affection. I'm a huge Ubuntu fan, but, um, when it comes down to it, what do I use 90% of the time? You know, it's, Here, it's, yeah, I'm also hearing uh, lots of uh, stuff about Ubuntu. We we have to see uh, uh, on the on the software side uh, with Windows 8. Windows uh, also seems to have this ambition to make um, this really a unified uh, experience that um, you could you you will be able to use on um, all of your devices. I mean, what I heard that uh, it is going to exist in I think eight or so different versions. So <laughs> I, I don't know what. Unified experience in, in that context um, will um, finally uh, mean, but um, I mean, sort of having this infrastructure thing, and um, I mean, it would also be really cool if I 
could, for example, if I have an Xbox and I have a game there, why not also play this on my uh, Windows mobile phone? So, uh, of course, uh, depends how they um, can make the deals with the uh, right owners and the, the, the companies and so on uh, with licenses. But, uh, I mean, it would be cool if you decide for an ecosystem to then also really use it seamlessly on um, all the different devices you use throughout the day. I mean, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it uh, if, I, I think that, that certainly Microsoft has uh, the reach to make that happen. Uh, the question is, do they have the moxie? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> have you installed uh, uh, Windows 8 Consumer Preview? You know, I haven't, and, and I, I, I you should. Mean I don't have a, a spare um, device at the moment. Probably, uh, if, I, if I did, um, I think I would, so... You know what's bad is I have spare devices coming out of my ears. I have machines running virtualization. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I have more hardware than I know what to do with. And 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 for some reason, I can't get excited about Windows 8. I want to. I just can't even get interested in it. It's just, it's so far outside the realm of anything that I even care about at this yeah. point. You know, I, I'm, I'm so focused on application and the cloud. Windows 8, uh, oh, fine, and when I need to I'll upgrade my Windows 7 to Windows 8 so that I'm compatible with the latest stuff, fine. I, I should worry about it because obviously, you know, we're going to have a lot of schools looking at making purchases mm -hmm. now, and those purchases are probably going to be running Windows 8, or they're going to be thinking, should I be running Windows 8? Should I not? Um, should I just stick with 7 and let this run for a year like every other Microsoft product should and wait for that first service pack? Um, or is Windows 8 going to be fully baked enough to you know actually actually run with it? And I, I just can't. <laughs> it's I just one more platform. Is, I think this is their uh, big problem. Um, so... Even assuming that it's a good uh, product, the way they present it, the way they keynote it, um, the way they write their 7,000 word blog posts um, <laughs> makes it just very hard and tedious for the, and I would call myself not a Microsoft enthusiast, but definitely interested in uh, what they do and also how they um, try to innovate. Uh, but it makes it really hard, uh, as you said, to get, ex get excited about it right. and then to say, okay, I... Um, I now had uh, the chance to read this blog post multiple times, and <laughs> so I'm going to install it. And um, this is, of course, what they could learn is the question. I think uh, they also want to be a little bit like that. Uh, it's just their style. It is. But, well, and they're uh, enterprising. You know, I mean, yeah. it's people who live, eat, and breathe enterprise, uh, you know, especially enterprise in the, in the business land and not educational enterprise, you know, that, that appeals. That That's fine. You know, okay, we'll read these technical documents, these technical bulletins, and yeah, let's make a, a formal evaluation of this new platform, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Well, there's a reason I don't work in the enterprise anymore. You know, it's boring. And uh, <laughs> it's a... Uh, so 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 is this. I I I for for a good while, Office 2010 and Office 2011, I used them avidly, mm -hmm. and I, and I and I mean they're great products. Actually, they're it's a really outstanding suite of products. And even now, I find myself if it's not in the cloud or it's not Adobe, mm -hmm. well, you know, they have. I mean, they have a great cloud solution. Apparently, just nobody they do. Uh, <laughs> either know knows about it or doesn't use it. So it, and, it's. Sometimes it's really a pity that... Um, They're their own enemy, I think, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, it comes down to that. Yeah, so oh, I will be curious to see what sort of uptake we see in, in education around Windows 8. If I don't, right now, I don't see any compelling reason to bother with an upgrade if mm -hmm. you are in an educational institution, and I don't see any compelling reason to go, uh, you know, if you're making purchases right now or you're thinking about, you know, 2000, you know, F FY 2013... Why put Windows 8 on your radar? I, I, I'm not seeing it because right I now think everyone's very familiar. Many of their machines still run on XP, probably. <laughs> very, very much so. And even the ones who've made the upgrades to, to Vista or to 7, mm. you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not seeing it. You've got a whole user base that's really quite familiar and quite comfortable with Windows 7. Uh, 
Well, seven actually works well, pretty well. Well, it can only get better than Wista. So, uh. <laughs> exactly. That was that was a real low. Even they admit that was a low yeah. for them. So. <laughs> oh well. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about your Dell story. As we talked so much uh, about uh, Microsoft um, already, I um, take my last um, story about children's books um, for the end. So what about this uh, customizable and personalized learning platform? Tell you know, I had a, I, I, I've got to say, you know, of course, uh, we, we were kind of uh, really gaga about Goldbook. I, I, I couldn't say enough about Goldbook, and, and I still can't. Mm -hmm. I've got to say though that some of the cooler elements of Goldbook mm -hmm. are are right there in in Dell's new approach, and, and I've got to arm wave a little bit. I'm under NDA, and there's there's still you know things that they're working out and pushing out. But um, really, this is this is meant to interface with lots of systems. It, it's you know open APIs and all the same stuff we expect. Um, but it's a system that is now very tablet friendly. That is very. Uh, screen friendly that is very uh, very much focused on assessment and just ongoing assessment not so much you know this this awful summative assessment that's what you'll rely on but this ongoing look at how people are progressing towards outcomes and and it, and it begs to be paired with a progressive school district that is focused on outcomes based education and so we're seeing you know okay here's here's our set of standards here are goals around those standards for these students here are related resources for those those goals here are resources for parents for those goals. Here are resources for students and resources for teachers, and here's a, a complete ecosystem of tools. And it, it's, you know, it, it is still, uh, I, I, I call it half-baked, and there's there's a lot of, of work being done, but it's a slick interface to something that is really, really useful. And the goal ultimately is to leverage Dell's big investments in, in the cloud and in, in data centers and infrastructure. But um, it is a, a particularly nice take on the learning management system and it's and this is this is really what I what I wanted to get at is that the learning management system itself is really really changing what we expect of our LMS the LMS used to just be a repository as a glorified blog uh, calendar you know and, and I put a, I put my stuff there at one point so I know it's it's somewhere there and if right. I really wanted I could dig it out but uh, then Right, students can check sure. this. Yeah. Right, they can't say they they don't know what the homework assignment is because it's it's on Moodle or it's on whatever, and um, on Blackboard. Uh, you know, and I think that the Dell's take on this is let's make this a really active system. We don't need to be co-opting, um, you know, uh, Facebook or anything like that. Let's let's have a system that is so complete in its guidance of learning that these other outside systems are sort of immaterial. And I think right now so many teachers are looking for ways to just use Facebook as their LMS because that's where they're going to post their assignments. So that's where they're going to get feedback from students or have some communication. This system I could very much see, not so much students because students love Facebook, but, but the teachers and the parents and the administrators wanting to use it because of all the information and data that it provides. So. It's interesting in the the Dell is obviously first and foremost a, a hardware company, but they yeah, cannot. Is it, that, uh, is it that they still want to pair this with their uh, so far like on demand uh, hardware solutions, or do they really think uh, they are going to find their fate in maybe uh, pivoting or? Um, developing themselves into a software company I, I think at least a service company I think that there's you know I think they even said I'm not sure was it mobile world Congress or, or elsewhere last week but know that they they aren't really a PC company anymore that they want to make this pivot and you know but as they explained to me as we were going through the interface they said look you know we want to provide this interface and we believe this is a compelling reason now for people to go buy one-to-one -one hardware and, and follow that up. But it's, you know, so often companies one-to-one -one hardware and they say, okay, here's the hardware, now here's all the cool things you can do with it. Dell is taking the opposite approach and saying, here's a platform that is really, really wonderful and you can use it on whatever device, but mm -hmm. we just happen to have this XPS 13, for example. Hardware. We've got some hardware that yeah. just happens to complement it very nicely. And if you're looking for a complete turnkey solution, 
gosh, we have it, but the platform comes first, which is what you and I have been saying for a long time, and, and a lot of folks sort of in, in our, our sphere have been saying, it's all about the platform, which is, again, why I can't get excited about Windows 8. Yeah. It's, what's, what's this platform that I want to use to interact with my peers, my coworkers, my colleagues, my students, my children? What, how do I want to interact with them? And it's not via Windows 8. It's via some sort of innovative web-based platform. And I want to make sure I've got a device that can access that well. Mm-hmm. The system itself is, is you know, very much, um, it's being designed to be very touch-friendly if you want it to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Adam Gary is, is my contact there. He's kind of their big educational liaison. And, and um, he and I have written a few things together as well, kind of predictive sorts of stuff. But mm-hmm. um, you know, what he said is that you know, he really loves the idea of, of a tablet in the K2 space where they're not producing a ton, they're, and they're not typing a lot, they just need to interact, and they need, they, they should still be able to track a goal, they should still be able to see where they stand, what sort of progress they're making, we still want to do response to intervention with these kids, we still want to, to do a lot of things with them, but, you know, big buttons on a screen are a lot easier for them to work with than, you know, than, than they are, uh, you know, than, than a regular keyboard or a mouse might be for them, so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of thought there that, you know, there's a space for tablets, and I'm sure we'll see things mm-hmm. from Dell that support this. Uh, their their streak efforts were, uh, you know, not uh, didn't didn't work out so well. I think we'll see things that. Yeah, it's uh, interesting um, to to see uh, not so many years ago how big they were, um, and how quickly things can change. Uh, yeah, but I think they've realized that yeah. it's it's not it's not about the hardware anymore, unless you're Apple. <laughs> so you know, I I I'm I'm, I'm really excited about this. I, I think that this I, I'm supposed to get uh, actually my hands on the platform uh, in a sandbox pretty soon, so I'll be writing more about it. But um, you know, the the final point to to make is that um, you know they're, they're, they 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 like to differentiate between personalization and customization, and that's their their new sort of shtick, which which kind of makes sense because lots of things can be can be customized. And and uh, you know that that's that's all well and good, but they they take it to a level where if students like to see a certain background, they, you know, kids, young people like to tinker with the interface. They like to you know have it be black on the back. It's about have, the color little, and yeah, exactly things that, that we think are really kind of irrelevant. Whatever, get the job done. For students, it's important, but yet there's this element then of personalization. So so that they call that kind of stuff customization, and mm-hmm. then they call personalization, uh, well, let's make sure we know what the students' learning styles are. Let's have them take a complete inventory, and we're going to provide them with the resources that are right for their learning style. It, very much actually like, like, like Goldbook has talked about and mm-hmm. some of these other applications, you know, let's make sure that the content they're receiving is directed at them, that it will actually be useful for them, and isn't just the same kind of stuff, now it's just online. Well, no, they're actually saying things that are germane to how they work and how they think. So that's that's personalization from their perspective. I like that. I, I you know, I, I I love seeing the the big hardware manufacturers do something that's that's actually really thoughtful. But the first thing I thought when I looked at this, I said, "Wow, you guys have actually talked to some teachers about this, haven't you?" I mean, it's really it's an interface that makes sense. That's already more than some other <laughs> initiative uh, right. <laughs> have ever done. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so you know, and, and you know, speaking of, of uh, personalization and customization and doing things that are you know relevant for your students, I just wanted to highlight one other story that's not a Dell story, but it, it is about how students work. About the Dell story, uh, what does your contact say? Uh, are they looking at the first half of 2012, or um, can they yet say like yeah, precisely? Like- we're thinking. I, I, it looks. The, the, it's a bit of a moving target, but really, I think we will see this in people's hands by the the end of the school year. Um, mm-hmm. They're saying spring. I'm mm-hmm. saying you know Probably uh, May May ish. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But but it will be in time. I think for people to as they're making final decisions. Budgets have been set. Um, now we're deciding on platforms. I think educators need to have this on their radar. Um, I think it's going to be be good enough and solid enough that if you want to hold off making some purchases or you're looking at new learning management systems, that you're looking at um, response to intervention, you're looking at uh, you know new online learning tools and blended learning in particular, uh, you need to wait until you see what Dell has to offer. It's it, it's impressive and and you know I've, I've not 
I've rarely been a, a Dell detractor, but uh, I have to say I, I think they've nailed something here, something that is big and, and something that, in fact, um, I'll probably have to speak to when I talk to talk to Blackboard. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's a uh, there's there's room for lots of competitors in this space, but if anyone needs to be concerned about this, it needs to be the Blackboards mm-hmm. and the Moodles of the world. You know, as we start seeing a unified platform that does a lot of important things and handles it in a really modern, touch friendly way that leverages all the technology and all the data mining and all of the the great things we can do with all of our assessment data um, and then feeds that back to teachers parents students you know really contributes to, to learning um, we, other other groups are going to need to be cognizant of it but certainly hang in there until you just see some news in May before you make too many big purchasing decisions when they feel comfortable maybe uh, we'll get someone um, on tape <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I have a feeling Adam would be happy to speak to us, and, and I will uh, see if I can snag him for, uh, I think, it, it, me, sure, maybe it next weekend or if not the, the weekend after. Yeah, I think yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, they're, they're getting close to the point where they can start uh, making some more things public and mm-hmm. uh, and where they want to start sharing a little 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 more in the way of screenshots and whatever else. So, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get, get Adam on here. Very cool story. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the last story that I want to talk about was there's an education group uh, in Washington State, my, my home state of, of good old Washington, and uh, they there were education cuts across the board in Washington State as there have been around the world and across the country and wherever else. We, we all know those are happening. Um, but what this group is saying is that online education, and again, now we're talking about this this idea of customization and learning in ways that, that make sense for you. Um, Online learning in particular was cut the most, mm-hmm. and um, we'll, we'll of course have the link up uh, on the the show notes. But the it was let me pull it up right here. Um, you know, it, it's what's interesting about this is that these students, you know, the, the every every school has an allotment, you know, per, you know, an amount that's paid per student, and that's kind of their budget number. That was cut across the board. Um, but what they cited was that students who have an online education are running about 15% less. And what, why this interests me is that, well, shouldn't they be running about 15% less if mm-hmm. they're educated online and educated at home? I, I, I'm in, As much as I would love to say, yes, more money for education, rah, rah, well, you know, the, one of the major promises of online education is not just it is important that students have the ability to learn in an environment that works for them. And I agree with that 100%. And I think that at least one or two of my kids probably would have been really well suited to that if, if online learning had been mature when they were at an age when mm-hmm. that was uh, something we could explore. Yeah. A little old for it now, so maybe maybe my daughter will we'll see what how she does. But uh, the last two maybe uh, yeah. Yeah, right they, they they may leverage it and and you know we've already talked with my nine year old about it and he's you know thinking about it as he kind of makes his way through school. You know maybe it'll, maybe it would make sense for him at some point. But for my older kids, it, it would have been a really powerful thing for them. Um, but but they it was just, just well, not. It just wasn't there yet. Yeah. It is here now, and then that's great. So we're able to give students a lot of what they need, but yet part of the thing is that it should be cheaper. It should be less expensive to deliver this way. Absolutely, so, and this has always been one of the big promises and also one of the points that uh, uh, made people uh, switch towards uh, online when... And at that point, I always said, whoa, 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 wait. Uh, It's not only about cutting costs, but of course, it is a big and important aspect. So um, it's about the learning experience and uh, the financial model as well. Right, right. the potential for for some savings. And it doesn't need to be huge savings because you still want to provide a great quality education with great teachers and great resources and there's infrastructure that needs to be invested in. And you know there are things that, that raise the cost, but overall, once a model is in place and once the infrastructure is in place, then it should be replicable. I agree, and, yeah. mm-hmm. You know, so I I I take issue with this lawsuit. Uh, again, it, it kind of offends my sensibilities to take issue with it, but but I do um, because I, I think that what the state has identified, and actually the Washington State Supreme Court ruled just recently that, uh, in fact, the state is not meeting its constitutional requirements to educate all students well. 
And so obviously, let's look across the board at how we're educating our students and what we need to do with that. Uh, but to, to say that you know those students who are being educated online shouldn't be educated less expensively, mm -hmm. it's, it runs totally counter to, uh, to, to what we believe can be a major benefit of online and blended learning. Yeah. So, so there, Washington State, take that. Talking about online learning, uh, let's take uh, a little moment and thank our sponsor. This week again, Language Lab, <laughs> languagelab.com. Yeah, they, they stay with us, and uh, I'm sure you um, heard, well, Christopher and myself also um, dropping uh, this name uh, a few times over the past couple of weeks. Um, and, I mean, uh, now, as I'm living in uh, in France and and be in this immersive environment, even though um, having had or having had French for several years in school before, but uh, if you have it like three hours a week and you you only talk with your teacher, I mean, it's not that you talk uh, in French with your peer peers or other students then uh, after class or, or something like that. So uh, living in France now, it is of course uh, on the one hand you are forced to, but you learn also a new vocabulary every day and you learn it really quickly and uh, it's, it's a very different experience. Now, not everybody of us can uh, move to another country, uh, depends on your job and, well, the parents, um, I think, are often willing to pay for a holiday, but um, it's usually a shorter period of time. So um, what Language Lab do is taking this uh, immersive experience online. They created a virtual city in Second Life called English City. And um, well, there, at the moment at least, it is uh, to learn English uh, from uh, native speaker, uh, professional teachers, but uh, in your free time, of course, you can fly or walk around in English city, and then also to talk uh, with your with your yes. peers. And um, I think uh, from from that aspect, if you are if it's not possible for you to travel, but you like this online experience and you like to talk with uh, with other people, um, I think uh, it's a great way and um, um, brings probably not a hundred percent over the same emotions, but uh, can create a similar experience to really being in, immersed uh, in an environment and well they also have professional offers aviation English, oil and gas English and uh, well of course uh, as, as we said um, at the beginning we are writing and talking to make a living and for that reason as well we are of course happy that um, some companies acknowledge this and uh, want to support our show and um, the concept of uh, independent media in education in general. So yeah, we are very happy um, to have them as a continuous sponsor. Yeah. All right. Um, my last story comes a little bit back to to books, but more um, to the ideas of, uh, or the more precisely, the environments being presented in books. So um, this was on USA Today, and um, it, it's a long-term story uh, a study carried out. I think they mentioned from they examined from 1938 until well far in the 2000s and they looked at how not only how are children's books written but what do the environments look like and of course not so, so surprisingly but there's a big difference in um, the especially the wild environments like 
jungle, a rainforest, and the animals you can find in those environments in the older books compared to um, books, uh, more modern books, where a lot of the action or considerably bigger amounts of the action take place in buildings such as uh, home, school, and uh, shopping centers, I suppose. Um, so less less about nature and animals. And, well, the thesis is that modern day kids lack knowledge or, or lack those environments and, of course, uh, as a consequence, don't have knowledge about that. You have two young kids, uh, or one very young and one <laughs> younger. He probably like doesn't like to be called a young a kid. A young kid, not so much. No. no. Um, so your father, um, does it concern you in any way, or um, is it more? That's our modern day life. Um, they are somewhat still exposed to exotic animals when going to the zoo or doing something in real life, or maybe even when you download um, some apps and those apps happen or the, the storyline happens uh, to take place in such an environment is it not so much of a big deal you know i i i don't think it is and now I, my perspective may be a little bit skewed my wife and i are both pretty big tree huggers so mm -hmm. we kind of make a real point of of environmental awareness and concern uh, my my son goes to a, a private school he actually came out of the public schools into a private school where uh, they focus on outdoor activities and the environment and they grow their own vegetables and they make food from those vegetables and they tap their maple tree right outside our house. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's perhaps not the, the general public school experience and he's there for a reason. Um, but that being said, I do think that the modern day world is somewhat more removed by and large from the, from the environment. And quite frankly, the, the books that our children read should be connected to their experiences. Mm -hmm. If those experiences are more from the, the perspective of, uh, you know, in, in buildings and less associated with the woods, mm -hmm. well, that, that is the experience they have, and, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It is up to the parents to, to make that experience happen, and, you know, we're getting our chickens back this, this spring, and, you know, we, uh, we went skiing yesterday. The, I think that makes the big difference, that you are um, very uh, sensitive parents uh, in, uh, in that sense um, who pay attention to that. If you take a normal public school, and I don't know about the uh, environment, but um, over here in Europe there's this famous chocolate with a, a violet cow. So children start thinking that cows are violet when you when you ask them, simply as it's the packaging of um, of this chocolate bar, and it's so so present everywhere, and. So I see that a lot with food. So if you ask them, okay, the, the burger, um, the pellet is beef. So for them, okay, this is meat, but not necessarily make the connection anymore to this comes from a once living animal, which is a cow. And now it's in my, or it's my food. So I think these are some uh, things that don't happen that much anymore. I don't think that they really have a problem to still identifying an elephant or, or a tiger. Nice. But um, probably thinking a little bit further uh, what the implications are and what do they eat and... Yeah. Well, it's that whole food to table movement, and I think we're seeing some some elements of that. Now, I'm lucky enough to kind of live in the country, which means I have miserable bandwidth, but it means that I at least have uh, you know access to to that sort of mentality where you can grow your own food, or yeah. you can find someone Feel down the, the road who who mm -hmm. sells you grass fed beef, and you go and you you see the cow, and and you you understand these things. So you know, mm -hmm. it, it, there is an impetus on parents to to make that connection and. You know, there, there's a reason that you know we don't eat at McDonald's and unless McDonald's wants to sponsor Review Ed, and then we can rethink that. But um, you know, I, I think as well, this study looks at a very, very tiny cross section of, mm -hmm. of books. These Caldecott Medal winners are, um, you know, they're they're wonderful books, but you know, the number of books that are actually available that talk about 
Joni the Cow or whomever, mm-hmm. I think are, are, are quite high. And this, these books are meant to be reflections of our culture. That's why they win the Caldecott Medal. So if our culture right now has moved away a bit and into the cities, well, yes, it has. So good, good for these books for reflecting that. But. And on the other hand, uh, I, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, parents also have the responsibility to prepare their kids for um, the world they will be living and working in. And so they have to know about things like social media or uh, right. Facebook or not only these things is um, <laughs> as almost everything in life. Uh, yeah, they, they need to know at least a little bit about everything right. and it's about the balance. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. If, if books could teach it all, we'd have a much easier job as parents. So I'd probably get more sleep. <laughs> um, apropos sleep, so uh, some more chapters are being written. That's Indeed. Um, Indeed. Anything up on the WizIQ blog, the your ZD, ZDNet uh, blog or column? Um, yeah, yeah. Between miserable weather last week and and days off from school and skiing, field trips, whatever else, I actually got nothing posted on ZDNet last week. So, so this weekend we're I'll be doing a, a wrap up on at least a, an early wrap up on the Dell story that we talked about. Um, finally, getting to posting about this sort of uh, you know budget concerns. Um, mm-hmm. How do we do do more with less and as usual and trying to, to fit the right things in and what do we hold off on and will we wait for some technology to sort of come off and come out of the gates what do we just go for it um so a little, little few thoughts on that. Uh, Wiz IQ blog has a fair amount more stuff coming up on uh you know the this this dichotomy that we have of mm-hmm. of teaching uh online, teaching various classes, learning online versus being a, a tool that, that we are uh to to uh contribute to more of a, a curricular based uh, online learning. So are we in the college environment, are we in the K twelve environment, or are we a, a, a marketplace? We haven't been all of them, but not letting like people think about that. It's not easy to find uh well to, to define your um, path uh, for yourself as a company and then also how it looks from the outside. If uh, right. you are a new, uh, let's say, teacher, um, what, what is with IQ uh, and, and what do you um, somewhat transmit um, as, as people uh, see it or experience it. Right, right. What, what, what is our brand? You know, mm-hmm. our, our brand is shifting right now. And, and I think that's a good thing. That, that's not a bad thing at all, but it's something we have to sort of manage and, and let people give some thought to themselves. And I think the, the whole brand of education is shifting as well and, and our accepting and willingness to accept different aspects of education is, is, is changing. Um, hopefully we can change along with it and write a little bit about that. How about yourself? So what I'm, do you be writing this week? I'm looking forward to uh, to reading more um, uh, on ZDNet and the WizIQ blog. Myself, uh, I'm back into the business of daily blogging on my personal blog. So um, that's, as always, uh, a little bit rusty at the beginning, but also <laughs> exciting. So um, I'm writing uh, mostly about education, of course, uh, but also just about stories um, that are interesting and appealing to me. So I have have an article up about this um, segmented sleep. So the myth of uh, the eight hour sleep in in, in one piece and um, that people with segmented (laughs) sleep like us too, I think, um, <laughs> can live very well, and that is also not unhealthy and an absolutely uh, normal thing, and that people in the past have basically at least have two big sleeping periods, but also segmented even even more or further, and that is a completely normal and human thing. So nothing to worry about. And um, today uh, I am going to publish an article about all those new, very professional YouTube edu channels. So um, YouTube, uh, I think, found some, on the one hand, pretty creative people who can put out uh, very professionally made uh, videos. And on the one hand, 
uh, the uh, several videos or the chan several channels I watched videos from uh, ha also have good uh, good content. So um, for what they put in a ten or even shorter um, video, it's pretty amaz amazing. So um, we have to see if um, they will sort of heat up and uh, speeds up. Um, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Look forward to reading that as well. And well, for people who are into language learning, I also launched my second um, YouTube channel to learn German. Wow. So you now have uh, Deutsch Happen and Deutsch Sprechen, so speak German. And uh, yeah, so people interested in our audience can check these out. And um, yeah. So pretty wonderful. busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Well, that's wonderful. Congratulations on getting that new channel Thank launched. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's always good. And now I think, as I saw him just behind the door, your son wants some daddy time. So, uh, <laughs> I expect so. Yeah, well, he had, he had well, dress rehearsal a... today for, uh, for his uh, vocal performance. So just got oh, back great. from that. And, yeah, oh, great. So um, Saturday. He, he wants to share the news. So then <laughs> um, have a great weekend and see you next week. You do the same. Thank you. Thank you.